Hello and welcome to Peaky Board Gamer. My name is Victor Rakos and today I will teach you a game called Dominant Species Marine, which is also the descendant of the classic Dominant Species game that was published in 2010. In the game, players take the role of ancient aquatic-based animal classes and they're trying to evolve their class competing against other animal classes. The game is for 2-4 to four players, takes more than 2 hours to finish, and I have to warn you that the video contains heavy rules that are gonna start right now. In the game, players are in control of an ancient species trying to dominate the Earth. During the game, specific Earth styles will be triggered to score, and the species that dominate will grant their players victory points. So players will be moving and expanding their species across Earth. However, species may only thrive in tiles that contain the elements they need to survive. Otherwise, they are endangered and could be eliminated. Players have a variety of actions to adapt their species to new elements or to bring the elements they need in hexes they reside in. Cards will also trigger important events and when the asteroid card is activated, the game will end. After the final scoring, the player with the most victory points will have led their species to survival in Dominant Species Marine. At first, place the board in the middle of the table. On the board we can see 15 pre-printed spaces that we must cover using the appropriate Wanderlust tiles. The top and the bottom tile depict a vent which is printed on top of them. These are the vent tiles. These are double-sided with one side depicting a geyser vent and the other one a smoke vent. Stack all the vent tiles here. Place a geyser vent on top of the land tile that should be placed in the topmost space and place a smoke vent on top of the tile that should be placed in the bottommost space. The rest Wanderlust tiles should be placed in stacks of 7 tiles into these 3 spaces on the board, facing downwards, and then flip the top tile from each one of these stacks facing upwards. These are the elements that come in 6 different types. In this video, I will call them by their color. Separate one element of each one of the colors and place the rest of the elements inside the white bag. These are terrain tiles that come in 7 different types. Place all of them inside the red bag. As it's pre-printed on the board, you need to place the 6 different elements to each corner of the coral reef in the middle of the board. Each one of the element types also have a dominance target marker. Place all these scoring markers in space 1 of the victory point track. For each one of the elements, there is a special action pawn and the corresponding action pawn control marker. Place the control markers side by side on this space on the board and then all the special action pawns right on top of their corresponding marker. These here are evolution cards. Find and set aside the one asteroid card. Shuffle the rest of the card and then randomly remove 10 cards from this deck. Then set aside another 4 cards from this deck and shuffle the asteroid card in these 4 cards. These 5 cards will go in the bottom of the stack and place the rest of the cards on top. Use the evolution card stack to fill the 5 spaces in the left side of the board. These cards should be placed facing upwards and the rest of the stack should remain next to them. There is also one survival card that should be placed next to the board as well. This is the action display. On it we see illustrations of medusas. These are meant for elements. Randomly draw elements from the white bag and place them onto each one of these Medusa illustrations on the action display. These starfish illustrations are meant for terrain tiles. Randomly draw three terrain tiles from the red bag and place one to each starfish illustration on the competition action. Then draw another five for the evolution action. These however should be placed in the spaces in specific order as indicated by these here. So I should place the kelp first, then the two reefs, then the sand, and finally the ocean. Each player selects one of the colors and takes all corresponding components of this color. These are action cylinders, the number of which depends on the number of players in the game. In a two players game, each player has seven available cylinders. In a three players game, players use five. And in a four players game, each player has four cylinders. In our example of a 3 players game, we will use 5. These cubes are 35 species which the player places on the gene pool space on the personal board. Then shuffle all the trade cards and randomly deal 3 cards to each player. Players then choose one of these cards and place it facing upwards in the dedicated space on the personal board. 
All of these cards grant players a special power or effect that they can use throughout the game, which usually contradicts to the rules that I will explain. All players should place their victory point marker on space 0 of the victory point track. Each player places three of their species onto the coral reef in the center of the board. Also, each player places one of their species cubes to the space which is to the left of their selected animal on the board. The game is now ready to start. Over the game, players will alternate turns selecting one action from the action display until the game send is triggered. The player turn order in this game is predetermined. According to this diagram and moving from bottom to top, crustaceans will take the first turn, followed by the fish, then the cephalopods, then the reptiles and then all over again. In our example, there is no player with crustaceans, so the first turn will be taken by the fish. We should mention that the same diagram also indicates the food chain. All ties during the game will be broken moving from top to bottom in this diagram. So the reptiles will win all ties and crustaceans lose all ties. I will now describe the general rules about the action display. Players have a specific number of cylinders available, but they can try and acquire one or more special action cylinders by dominating in specific elements. Action spaces in the action display are indicated by the illustration of a relic. So on their turn players have to choose one of the relic spaces and then go on with the action. We can see that some of the spaces depict a white cylinder. These spaces are only meant to be used by special action pawns. Let's see all the rules of pawn placement and let's set aside the special action pawns for now. Rule number one. Normal action pawns may only be placed in empty action spaces. Rule number two, normal pawns may never be placed in action spaces for special action pawns. Rule number three, after an action pawn is placed, the next pawn has to be placed to the right or below the action of the player's last placed pawn. So after placing my first pawn here, action spaces to the left and above that pawn cannot be selected. For example, I could select this action, then select that action, then select this one, and so on and so forth. Now, the special action pawns have none of these limitations I just explained. First of all, they can be placed in any space and not just in the action spaces depicting the special action symbol. Also, they can be placed in action spaces that are above or even to the left of your last pawn. On top of that, a player having a special action pawn can select a space which is already taken by an opponent's basic pawn. The displaced pawn will return to the owner's available pawns and can be reused in the next turn. If a player on their turn has no available pawns to place, then they must take the retrieve action and take all of their pawns and the special action pawns back to their supply. Of course, the player can retrieve their pawns even earlier. Now it's time to explain each one of these actions in detail. Let's start with the action Abundance. With this action, the player chooses any available element and places it on any tile corner that has no element. By placing this here, nothing changes for Sigra's meadow tile, but this sand plain tile now also supplies green element to the species it contains. We can see here that the Autotrophs Depletion and Regression action have a box which will be populated with elements. While these boxes are empty, these actions have no effect. In the game, there are three main events that will be occasionally triggered. Extinction, Survival and Recede. When the right time comes, I will explain how these are triggered and what steps you need to follow. But during the Recede event, elements will follow the arrows and fall within these boxes, thus giving a meaning to these actions. I have added some elements into these boxes so I can explain these actions. The Autotrophs action has two spaces, one depicting a smoker van and the other a geyser van. By selecting one of these actions, you activate one smoker or geyser tile and you can do one of two different things. From the selected vent tile, you may either remove one element that is also in the Autotrophs box or swap any element with one from the Autotrophs box. Removed elements return back in the white bag. With the depletion action, the player chooses any element on Earth 
that matches one of the elements in the depletion box and removes it. With the adaptation action, the player selects any available element from the board, placing it to an empty grey space of their animal needs, thus adapting their species to more elements. Players may never have more than six elements, so if you don't have a vacant grey space, the action has no effect. There are good reasons for a player to have one element type more than once. We'll find this out in a bit. The rightmost special action space gives the player the extra option to swap a previously placed element with a new one. The old element is removed and placed in the white bag. In the regression action, the player simply places one species cubes from their gene pool into one empty box that I show you here. This action offers the player who has a cube here some kind of protection during a recede event. So I'll put an asterisk here and I'll come back to it when I explain the recede event. Placing a second cube here offers the player nothing more except than blocking other players from getting this protection. With the speciation action, players add more species cubes from their gene pools to the board. Each one of the action spaces is linked to an element. The player then selects any one element of the selected type on Earth and then proceeds with placing cubes to the adjacent tiles. An element of course can have up to three adjacent tiles, like this one here. But how many cubes can a player place? It depends on the tiles. The aid next to the speciation action shows the number of cubes that can be placed to each one of these tiles. So I could place up to three cubes in the C mount, up to four cubes in the open C tile, I chose to place only two, and up to two cubes in the coral reef, I choose to place only one. With a special action space, the player may choose any element on the board and place cubes in the adjacent tiles as normal. The player is simply not limited to an element connected to the action space. With a Wanderlust action, the player adds a new tile onto the earth. The player selects any Wanderlust tile and then flips the next one facing upwards. Then the player adds the new tile to earth by connecting it to at least one side of an already existing tile. Let's say the player places the tile here. Then the player may take one element from the action and place it to a vacant corner of the new tile. Finally, the player gains bonus victory points for the number of adjacent tiles to the new one that are of the same terrain type. Whenever players gain bonus victory points of something, like in this case here, or in cards, etc., you always consult this table which is in the bottom left corner of the board. So, how many open ocean tiles do we have next to the newly placed open ocean? Only two. Remember, this is a vent now and not an open ocean. According to this table, the player gains three bonus victory points for this placement. As a last step, following the food chain order, each player can move any number of their species from adjacent hexes into the new one. In our example, only the cephalopods player has a couple of species cubes that may be moved onto the new tile. The special action space of Wanderlust allows the player to take another turn after completing the Wanderlust action. With Tectonics action, the player adds a new vent tile on top of another tile on the board. Now, if the selected tile that will be covered with the vent tile is on the top part of the grid, then you place the vent with the geyser side facing upwards. Otherwise, you use the smoker side. For these three specific spaces, the player chooses the side. Now, with the normal action space, the player has to select one tile which is on the edge of the grid. While with a special action space, the player may choose any tile on the board. My options are these three tiles. Let's say I want to cover the open ocean with a smoker vent tile. First, if there are any species on top of the selected tile, set them aside and then place the vent tile on top of the tile. Then gain bonus victory points according to the number of other vents that are adjacent to the newly placed vent. Whether the vents are smokers or geysers is inapplicable, so now the player gains only one victory point for having one adjacent vent. Then, place one species cube from each animal on top of the tile and return all the rest back to their owner's gene pools. These cubes are not eliminated. 
Finally, the player performing the action may either add one species cube from their gene pool or from the pool of eliminated species. During the game, all species cubes that become eliminated are set aside in an eliminated pool. They don't return back to the player's gene pools. The tectonics action is one way to revive an eliminated cube. With migration action, players can move their species on Earth to an adjacent tile. Players may move a number of species up to the number indicated on the action space. And with a special action space, players may move any number of their species. So with this action, for example, I can move up to three of my species. You must first choose the species that will move, and then you can move them. Remember the survival card we set aside during setup? This card goes to the player who has the most species on vent tiles. This could happen at any time. In our example, the orange player is the owner of the survival card because they have two cubes on vent tiles. As soon as this changes due to any reason, the card must change hands. Important, if there is a tie, no player receives the card. The card returns back next to the board. During a survival event, the owner of the survival card will gain bonus victory points for the number of vent tiles they occupy. With competition action, the player first selects one tile on Earth of the indicated terrain type and the tile must also contain at least one of that player's species. Then the player eliminates a number of opponent species from that tile up to the number shown here. With a special action space, you can choose two tiles of any terrain, which again have to contain at least one of your species, and then eliminate one opponent species cube from each one of these tiles. You may also select the same tile twice and eliminate up to two species cubes. Example, the orange player selects this grass tile in which they have presence. The player then eliminates these two species cubes which are moved to the eliminated pool. With the evolution action, the player first scores one tile of the indicated terrain type and then the player also resolves one card from the card display. Every tile on Earth depicts the number of players that will be ranked and the number of victory points scored. The orange player selects this sand tile to be scored. The first player will gain three victory points and the second will gain two. There is no third ranking. So the orange player gains three victory points and the reptiles gain two because they are higher in the food chain than the fish. After scoring, the player chooses and resolves one of the cards in the card display. Each card slot has a number next to them, from 1 to 5. The number next to the action space indicates up to which number the player can choose a card to resolve. So, in my example, I can choose one of these four cards. All the card effects are pretty straightforward. After the player resolves the effect, the card is discarded. Then all cards above the empty space are pushed downwards and a new card is placed in the fifth card slot. If there is a yellow part in the card, it is resolved immediately, as it said here, when this card enters play, score each ocean tile and each smoker vent tile. Then the card is placed there. Now, if the new card depicts this symbol, then an extinction event takes place immediately. And if the card has this symbol, then a survival event takes place. When an extinction event takes place, all endangered species on Earth are eliminated. Species are endangered when there is not even a single element on the tile they accommodate, which is also in their needs. According to the orange player's needs, all of these cubes will be eliminated. When a survival event takes place, if a player has the survival card in their possession, they gain bonus victory points for the number of vent tiles they occupy. Here the blue player occupies the card and gains three victory points for occupying two vent tiles. With the domination action, the player calls for any element in which he dominates in order to gain the corresponding special action pawn. Not all of the action spaces are used depending on the number of players. This, for example, is only used in a four-player's game. In a three-player's game, only these two action spaces are used. To find out if you dominate in one element, you need to multiply the number of these elements on your needs on your board to the number of tiles that supply this element and that the player has at least one species cube on. 
So my dominance value for, let's say, the gastropods is equal to 2 multiplied by 3 equals 6. If this value is greater than the target marker of the corresponding element, then you dominate on that element. Of course, it's possible that more than one player dominate the same element at the same time. So, the orange player could perform the domination action and call for gastropods, in which he knows he currently dominates, to take the special action pawn of the corresponding element. If the action pawn is still on the board, the player takes both the pawn and the ownership marker and brings them in their play area, and the special action pawn is now ready to be used in the next turn. If, however, the special action pawn was already owned by another player, then the phasing player steals the ownership marker and the pawn, and again they can use it in a later turn. Finally, if again an opponent owned the special action marker, but the marker was already played in the action display, then the player just takes the ownership marker, and that player will take the special action pawn the next time they retrieve their pawns. As a last step, you must move the target marker of the corresponding element to your dominance value. The last retrieve action does not require placement of a pawn. When players perform this action, they simply retrieve all of their basic pawns placed on the action display, but also all of the special action pawns for which they have the ownership marker. After retrieving their pawns, if the player's cube in the food chain track is still on the left side, it is moved to the right, otherwise it's not moved. Important, if when moving a cube to the right, all of the cubes are to the right side, then a recede event is triggered and takes place immediately. Let's see the steps of the recede event. The first step of the recede event is to remove all elements that are surrounded by exactly three vent tiles. In our example, this is applicable for these two elements, which are removed. The next recede step is to resolve the regression action. Players that have no cube in the regression boxes must remove one element from their needs which is similar to an element in the regression box. Printed elements can never be removed, of course. So the purple player avoids removing the yellow element, but since there is one blue element, they must also remove one blue element from their needs. Next, remove all elements from depletion, regression, speciation and wanderlust actions. All of these tiles return back into the bag. Then the elements in the abundance, autotrophs and adaptation actions must follow the arrows. In the next step, randomly refill all the Medusa spaces with new elements from the bag. Next, remove all terrain tiles from competition and evolution action and place them into their bag and then refill the spaces with new terrain tiles in the same way we did during setup. The last step is to reset all cubes in the food chain track to the left side. After the reset event, proceed the game as normal with the next animal's turn. Let us now see how this game's end is triggered. As the game progresses, eventually the asteroid card will come into play. The game proceeds as normal. When the asteroid card is resolved by a player, then that's how the game's end is triggered. However, the game does not end yet until the next reset event would trigger. Then, instead of performing the reset event, you perform the following end game steps. First, you perform an extinction event followed by a survival event for one last time. Then you score all tiles on Earth and players gain victory points. Finally, players gain additional victory points equal to the sum of the target markers of the elements for which they have the corresponding ownership marker. In other words, the Cephalobot player ended the game having the green and the white element ownership markers in their possession, so that player will gain an additional 8 plus 6, 14 victory points. The player with the most victory points wins the game, and in case of a tie, the player who is higher in the food chain wins. In our case, it's the Cephalopods player. And that was the video of this great game, Dominant Species Marine. I hope you really liked it, and if you want to see more videos like that, please subscribe to my channel. Until next time, have fun and play more board games. <laughs>